I started out with social media as a little bit of a kind of a skeptic. Um, when Facebook came out, I was still in college at Wheaton College, and I, I was just like very resistant. I'm not going to join this. I didn't join it until I think 2008 or 2009. So I was the first. I was like the last person of my friend group to join it. And the same thing with Twitter. I just joined that a few years ago. So it's just been kind of an interesting um, journey for me because I, I was very skeptic skeptical about social media at first. And uh, now I'm social media manager at a university. So I'm tweeting all day. That's my job, it's just to tweet. <laughs> so it's, it's been an interesting journey. So I think my story with social media is being kind of a skeptic, having kind of thoughts about like what, is, what are the ramifications of this, um, as well as being a practitioner of it professionally. Um, I think that comes into play in what I want to talk to you today about, which is how to use social media in a productive, savvy, you know, good, efficient way, but while also being mindful and kind of skeptical about some of the maybe negative ways that we can use social media. So hopefully this will be helpful for us to just think about as Christians, you know, how can we think critically about the way that we use social media and how can we use it in a Christ-like way while also being effective at it. So. I don't know that I need to, to tell you guys this, but social media is powerful. Um, you know, Facebook has 900 million people on it. Twitter has 15% of adult internet users are on Twitter, and half of them check it every day. So these, these platforms are incredibly powerful, and um, it's just changing the face of cultures, and we all, we all know that already. Um, just by way of gauging kind of the, the social media activity of those in the room, um, raise your hand if you're on Facebook. Okay, I know you're not. Gary, you're not? Okay. Okay, so keep your hands up if you're on Twitter, too. Okay, keep your hands up if you're on uh, Pinterest. Okay, what about Google, Google Plus? The ghost town of social media. Um, what am I missing? Foursquare? Anyone on Foursquare? LinkedIn. Okay. Am I missing any major ones? Uh, Tumblr, I guess that's kind of social media. Instagram, any Instagram users out there? Okay, so why is social media powerful? There's numerous re reasons we could talk about. Uh, it's an efficient, nimble mode of communication to large numbers of people. You can send out messages in mass to however many thousands of followers, friends you have. Uh, it has this this kind of explosive viral potential to accelerate a message uh, organically and virally. That's one of the unique attributes of social media. It builds buzz around a, a message that you want to communicate or around a, a piece of art or a video. Um, it's a great way to build your network to kind of grow the circle of your audience. If you are a performer or an artist or just a business or a brand, it's a great way to just build your audience. Um, I think one aspect that's very interesting to me is the way that social media is transforming the way that we process news and kind of experience the world. If you think about, um, you know, decades ago, for the most part, people read the same newspapers in any given city, or we watched one of four main networks. So there were there were much fewer options for how we all kind of collectively processed what was going on in the world. But with social media, the way that we can all kind of self-select and curate our own individual feeds of media like you could you can populate your feed with only conservative you know news outlets or only liberal or only comedians or actresses or whatever so our the way that we experience the world is is so much different because we all have different um, hybrids of in information gathering and i think that's that's a very interesting um, just transformation and i I think the effects of that have yet to be seen in culture. Um, I think another big thing about social media that makes it powerful is that it's reinventing the way interactivity can enhance our experience of life. So if you think about like an event like this, you have like one level of the event, which is just you and me in this room together, me talking, you listening. But social media can create a whole other level where there's a hashtag and there's conversations going on about what's going on here in this event. So you think of like the Super Bowl or these big events in culture. You have the event itself, 
which is, is mediated through a television screen. So there's one level of mediation, but then there's this whole other level, this whole other text of conversation going on. And I think that's a very interesting aspect of social media. OK, so enough about how social media is powerful. Uh, social media can also be troublesome. I think it can be very problematic. Um, and I just, just want to highlight a few ways that I think social media can be obnoxious and ways that people can use it in kind of negative, obnoxious ways. And you guys will probably all recognize some of these uh, points. So here's one. Name dropping people you're with, places you're at, or that you're on a plane going somewhere. Um, I'm sure you guys all have that one guy on your Twitter feed who's just always kind of bragging in, in subtle ways about, you know, hey, I'm, I'm on a plane getting ready to take a, an overnight flight to New York because I'm meeting with my publisher, um, <laughs> those sorts of things. So uh, that's one obnoxious way to use social media. Here's another one, promoting your website, article, book, sermon, photo, or whatever incessantly. Um, I think as ministry people, like pastors, people in the Christian world, unfortunately, can be really bad about this. I know a lot of like big name pastors and authors who are just constantly shilling their own things and their books and their articles or whatever. And that can get really old and it, it can kind of raise questions about, you know, are you egotistical? You know, where's your humility? Here's another obnoxious thing, being routinely negative and or opinionated. Um, how many of you guys know people like that on social media who are just always negative? Everything they say is negative. They just have to have their opinion heard. Um, there's, there's a lot of people on my Facebook wall and Twitter feed that are so negative, I've, I unfriend them or unfollow them because I just, who wants to be bombarded with more negativity uh, in their day-to-day -day life? And then finally, just bombarding people with too many status updates or tweets. Um, you guys probably all have people like that in your social media circles who do it a little too often. Like, do we really need to know about what you're doing every hour, what you're eating for breakfast, where you're going? Um, I think there can be a little overkill with how often you share and, and, and what you share. Uh, there's also something that's called humble brag. Anyone familiar with this term? It's kind of a term that social media has given rise to. Um, it's basically like a way to utilize social media's invitation to share about what's going on in your life, but to do it in kind of a slightly braggadocious but self-deprecating manner. Um, ultimately, it's glorifying yourself, but you kind of do it in kind of a pseudo humble way. So that would be kind of like the guy who I mentioned earlier who tweets, getting ready to take a red eye to New York for meetings with a potential publisher. Hope I'm not a zombie tomorrow morning. So it's just kind of like, yeah, you, it's so hard that you're taking a red eye to New York for your publisher meeting. Here's, here's an example of uh, Chloe Kardashian. I still can't believe I have a Cosmo cover. Random tweet. So just in case you wanted to know, she has a Cosmo cover. Um, and uh, it's not random at all, I think. I think it's probably a very calculated move that Cosmo wanted her to share that news. And here's one from our friend Rick Warren. I'm truly humbled you follow my tweets. I pray they enrich your life and strengthen your ministry. God bless all 200,000 of you. <laughs> yeah. So just in case you, know, you didn't know, I have 200,000 Twitter followers. Uh, now, I don't know Rick. He probably didn't even think about that. But it comes across a little bit uh, like a humble brag. So how many of you are familiar with clout.com? So this, this can also become a little bit of an obnoxious thing in social media. Um, so essentially, clout is a tool to measure your overall social media influence. It's based on how many followers you have. It's based on like the prestige level of your followers, what their clout scores are. And it's, it's about your, how many people retweet your things or interact with your mentions. And everyone on Twitter has a clout score, whether you know it or not. Now, clout, I've seen it become kind of an addiction with some people. They, they check their clout score every day. And they, they get to this place where they're so concerned about uh, their clout score rising and falling on any given day, that they start to adjust their messaging on social media geared towards clout. So they, they say things intentionally to get a response. They, they, they tweet things or put things up there that will get tons of likes or tons of retweets. And uh, I just think that can become a little bit annoying when people aren't being themselves. They're just trying to boost their clout score. So, OK. so. When is it okay to self-promote on social media? 
Um, I think there are some cases when maybe we can argue that it is appropriate to self-promote on social media. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the justifications that we might see for that. So the first one is this idea of permission marketing. How many of you have heard that term? So Seth Godin says permission marketing is the privilege, not the right, of delivering anticipated, personal, and relevant messages to people who actually want to get them. It recognizes the new power of the best consumers to ignore marketing. It realizes that treating people with respect is the best way to earn their attention. So it's the idea that people are following you on Twitter out of their own free will. They want to receive. They're in inviting you to like promote themselves to you. So why, why should we feel bad about promoting ourselves on social media? It's people are choosing out of their own free will to follow us. Second justification is this idea that you're offering the world good content. So, you know, people say, like, why should I be ashamed of promoting my stuff? It's good. You know, the world needs to see this great video I created or this great article. Now, the problem with that is everyone thinks that their stuff is good. So where, how do we actually like, figure out what should be promoted and what shouldn't? Because everyone honestly thinks what, what they have is good and should be shared. And even if you do have good content, do you really need to be sharing it like 10 times a day on Facebook and Twitter? Probably not. OK, a, th a third justification is this idea of truth promotion. Um, Christian blogger Jeremy Myers says, I think there's a difference between self-promotion and truth promotion. <clears throat> I try to promote truth and keep myself out of it as much as possible. I feel that if you have truth to teach others and you, ha you have every responsibility to get it out to as many people as possible who want to hear it and who will benefit from it. So I think that's an argument you hear a lot. Like As Christians, we have the truth, so it's our obligation to share it with others. And similar to that is this idea that we have an obligation to share our talent. We have a responsibility to you know, share what God has given us, whether it be writing talent or video creation or whatever. We have a responsibility to share that. Um, so I came across this interesting blog post from a fairly well-known seminary professor. I, will, I won't say his name, but he's active on social media, and he's, he's been accused of being a little egotistical. So in, in his defense, he says, I am responsible to make good on the gifts God gave me, to not bury my talent or hide my lamp under a table. Since I'm a teacher and writing, I need to get the word out. I am driven by my conviction that Christianity is true, rational, and pertinent to all of life, that Jesus is Lord of all. I am also a sinner, so I may at times promote my own work too much or present things on Facebook that are not fitting. Please bear with me. Strong criticism that judges my motives, given by strangers, is hard to swallow, I must admit. It's rude, but even rudeness can speak the truth. So I think there's definite tension here between recognizing that social media is <clears throat> incredibly effective and useful in some ways, but can be potentially harmful and problematic. And I think, as Christians, we have to wrestle with that, that tension. How do we use social media in a way that is, is offering like a best practice of its use in terms of our effectiveness and efficiency without losing our souls in the process? So does anyone have any comments about other justifications that you might have in your own work in terms of this idea of self-promoting on social media? Because I'm sure we've all like, thought about the ethics of that. Well, I saw it, uh, one that really helped me, um, where on Facebook it was, I listened to Kim Commando, who teaches about everything digital. And on Facebook she said, oh, I'm going out of town <coughs> this week, so I'm going to take my show right now. So if you have a question right now, call in. Uh -huh. And I Right then, my husband and I were talking about a question we had. So she was basically saying, I have a service to provide. You can reach mm -hmm. me now. And so I was able to call in right. and get the, the, and I was very grateful. Now, yes, she was promoting herself, but she was yeah. really offering me right. something of value that was time sensitive. Mm -hmm. And so that was a <clears throat> service. It's kind of like that permission marketing thing. Like, you have a service, and people are willingly wanting that service. So you're putting it out there, chances are someone out there will appreciate that you're offering it. Yeah. Any other thoughts on, on justifi justifications for this sort of thing? Okay, so I want to get into um, my list. I, have, I created 12 don'ts of using social media, how to use social media without losing your soul. And then I created um, 12 do's. So we'll go through the don'ts first. Okay. 
First, don't. <clears throat> don't tweet mostly about yourself, what you're doing, speaking engagements, travel, how cool you are. So this kind of goes without saying, it's kind of this whole pride issue as Christians. We shouldn't be constantly talking about ourselves. Now, this is difficult because social media is designed for this very thing. It's the Facebook wall beckons us it, with questions like, what's on your mind? What's going on? So it, the whole structure of social media is geared towards yourself. It's geared towards this narcissistic kind of, what are you doing right now? What are you eating right now? Where are you? Um, Instagram, these other geo-social platforms are about sharing where you are. It's all about you. So the very structure of social media goes against this, but I think this is a don't that we should try to avoid. Second, don't. Don't think about an experience mostly in terms of how you might share it on social media. <laughs> so social media has a, has a tendency to consume our whole lives and become an obsession. Where we're checking Twitter and Facebook multiple times a day we're, when we're waiting in line for something or have any sort of downtime in our life, we just get out our little phone and we're checking our social media feeds. And I think that's lamentable in, in the sense that we're losing this sense of like, can't we just be alone with our own thoughts? Why is everything we do have to be thought through this lens of how can I share this on social media? I recently saw this YouTube video. Um, and you, you can Google it on YouTube. It's called Eat It, Don't Tweet It. And it's this parody video of like hipster foodies who like go around to fancy restaurants and they bring their cameras and they're like taking Instagram photos of all the food. And they're more interested in how, how they can share the fact that they're eating like artisan greens and artisan muffins or whatever with the world. <clears throat> they're more interested in that than actually enjoying the food. So <laughs> I think I think we all kind of can relate to that to some extent. When you're on vacation, you know, you have an impulse, oh, I have to share this photo with my Instagram community, or I have to post something to Facebook, like, I just checked in here. And I think that um, that's something that as Christians we should resist. We should value being present in our experiences, being present in our thoughts. At the end of the day, the have a thought and share it with the world mentality of social media I think erodes our inner thought lives. It becomes harder to keep anything to ourselves, to be reflective just for ourselves, because we become so used to the notion that anything worth saying has to be shared on social media. So when we sit alone and just contemplate something that isn't meant to be shared, we almost don't know what to do with ourselves. And I think that's a dangerous place to be. We need to protect that, that kind of sacred space of just being present in our experiences and not thinking about it in terms of how can we invite the whole world into this experience with me? Does that make sense? Okay. Third, don't. Don't retweet only good things about you or your book, your church, or your brand. Promote others' content more than your own. And again, this is difficult because social media seems to be tailor-made for self-promotion. It's hard to resist the urge to send out multiple tweets or Facebook updates about everything that you're trying to promote. Um, my rule of thumb is kind of like, for any article I have that I want to promote, I only send one self-promoting message on any given platform. So I'll do one tweet about it, one Facebook update, one maybe Google Plus if I feel like it that day, but no one really cares about Google Plus. Um, and then I just don't do any more. I, don't, I, I know people on Twitter who like send out so many, like, hey, check out my book. It's on Amazon. Check out my article. And they do it just continually throughout the day. And it's like, no one wants you to do that. That's annoying. So don't bombard people with that. Um, keep it kind of do it in moderation, I guess. So fourth tip, don't include please retweet in your tweets. <laughs> Use bad English, too many words in all caps, or too many exclamation points. So these are just kind of like grammar etiquette rules of social media. Um, how many of you know people that like always violate those rules? I, I know one guy that like says please retweet to everything he tweets, and it's just like, how, that's, I know, it's like, <laughs> Why do you have to ask? Like, if it's really something I want to retweet, I'll retweet it. Here's an example. Um, <laughs> just previewed our Mother's Day video. It's the best I've ever seen. See you this weekend for a whole mother level in caps. So that's just, I don't know. I, I kind of cringe when I see all caps and the U instead of the U. This is a pastor in Texas. Some of you might know of. No offense to Ed, but that's a good example. OK, so number five, don't crowd your social media feeds with check-ins from all the glamorous places you've been. Um, no one cares where you are at any given moment. Um, 
it, we have this sense that like everyone really needs to know what I'm doing right now. I'm at this beautiful park or at a beach or at this great restaurant. But I think this this kind of like geosocial like I, I need to let the world know that I'm checking in somewhere. It, it can become a classic example of humble brag. And I think the same goes for Instagram. You know, the people who connect their Instagram feeds with like Facebook and Twitter. <clears throat> to me, that's just really annoying when like you see, see all these like check-ins and like Instagram pictures from, from wherever these people are. Okay, six, don't tweet or post something while in a highly emotional state or without taking time to consider whether it should be shared or not. Now, this, this is a problem because the culture of social media is about the instant. It thrives on the instantaneous. It encourages on-the-go communication. It beckons you to have a thought and share it with the world. It's not necessarily an environment conducive to patient reflection and deliberate consideration. Uh, Shane Hips says, when he's talking about the culture of social media, he says, the problem is speed. It demands such rapid creation of ideas that you aren't allowed the blood, sweat, and tears in a wrestling that a pope must do or the decades of solitude that a mystic might, might do. So it's this idea that like social media and it's instantaneous, like what's on your mind now, it just doesn't lend itself to the kind of like thoughtful consideration that like big ideas need to be mulled over. And you know, we, we sometimes tweet things without thinking and the ramifications unfortunately can be pretty bad. So I think as Christians, we must resist the urge to share first and reflect later. We should think very carefully and not be so quick to the keyboard draw when we have a, a thought to share. Okay, here's one that you probably all can relate to. Don't post important life news on social media before communicating it to your closest family and friends in person. How many of you have like an example of that? Like that someone that you thought you were close to like shared their birth news or their wedding announcement just with you on social media along with hundreds of other people at the same time. How does that how does that make you feel? Like spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, I think special, important, relevant. Right. This is one of the problems of, of social media, I think. It, it puts all friends on the same plane. So it removes the intimacy of kind of these different levels of intimate relationships. So people are disclosing rather significant things about themselves. We're engaged, we're having a baby, we're mourning the death of our father-in-law. They share this with their entire mass of friends or followers rather than to like an inner circle first. I've heard of more than one friend who's heard about an engagement of even like a family member um, on Facebook or Twitter, and that's just a horrible thing. Uh, another quote from Shane Hips from Flickering Pixels, I think captures this tension <clears throat> well. He says, intimacy happens the moment we are invited into the exclusive VIP room of another person's life. Intimacy always follows the statement, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone before. These are risky words of deep trust and vulnerability. The exclusivity of personal information creates the conditions of intimacy. That intimacy is preserved in that relationship as long as the information remains exclusive. The moment it is available to anyone and everyone is the moment intimacy evaporates. So I think that's important for us to remember. If we want to maintain intimacy with kind of our closest friends, we can't just think of them as another contact on social media that we communicate to in the same way. We have to preserve and kind of value our offline intimacy with our friends and uh, family and closest intimate uh, connections. So along the same line, I think, don't spend more time on social media than you spend communicating to people face to face. Social, me social, social media creates the illusion that by being constantly in touch with someone that you know them more, that by accepting a friend request, you have a real life human connection. But as Shane Hips pointed out in that quote, intimacy goes beyond just collecting friends on social media and keeping tabs on people in this kind of impersonal, just scrolling through your feed way. Um, we need to take time to reach out and create intimacy and to cultivate that offline. In a piece in The New Yorker, Malcolm Gladwell argues that social media platforms are built around weak ties. He says, Twitter is a way of following or being followed by people you may have never met. Facebook is a tool for efficiently managing your acquaintances for keeping up with the people you would not otherwise be able to stay in touch with. That's why you can have a thousand friends on Facebook as you could never have in real life. So I think the question for us as Christians in terms of wanting to establish community and strengthen relationships is, 
we need to just ask the question, like, are people really known on social media? How important is physical presence in the establishment of intimacy? Shane Hipp says, the internet is seen as the holy grail of building community, but he cautions that digital social networking inoculates people against the desire to be physically present with others in real social networks, networks like a church or a meal at someone's house. Being together becomes nice, but non-essential. So I think we need, to, as Christians, we need to ask the question, like, what are we missing when online social networking friendship becomes the norm for how we interact with people? Um, we need to reconsider our ideas of knowing and being known. Does it, does it really just consist of observing someone's life through their photo albums on Facebook or checking in on their like, status updates? Um, I don't think so. I think it goes beyond that. Um, social media can be a very tightly controlled space where people have kind of this like, awkward control over how they're perceived. People can construct their profiles in just the right way. And I don't think that's how you really know someone. You know someone in the awkward encounters over coffee where they're not, they're not as kind of put together um, that they can, they can be in social media. The nuances and the nonverbals of human communication I think are important, and we have to seek those out in offline relationships. Does that all make sense? OK. Nine. Don't flaunt your relationships by having public interactions on social media. Have conversations privately. Email people, chat. Direct message will do just fine. So I, I kind of call this the paradox of public intimacy. In the world of social media, as we know, like private conversations are now out in public. They're on the Facebook walls for all to see. They're on Twitter profiles for all to see. It's kind of similar, I think, to the cultural habit um, of like someone talking, having a loud personal conversation on their cell phone in public, like on a subway or like on a street corner. Um, it's this sort of like online relational exhibitionism of Twitter and Facebook. It favors public bursts of communication over private, um, quieter email messaging, for example, in the same way that the cell phone has rendered the privacy of the phone booth moot. How, how many of you have seen a phone booth any, any time recently? That, have you? <laughs> They're a thing of the past, because now phone conversations, which, you, which used to be thought about as a private thing that you had to go into a little booth to have, now it's just a public, like you can listen in on someone's breakup conversation who's next to you at a restaurant. And I think that kind of cultural public intimacy is starting to show itself up in, in social media in the way that you can kind of <clears throat> have a very personal interchange with someone on a Facebook wall, and everyone can look in in this weird kind of um, manner that they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be privy to this conversation, but they can't turn away. Um, so I think that's a problem with social media. It cheapens the idea of relationships by making it accessible to everyone. Again, it goes back to this intimacy doesn't, isn't intimacy anymore when it's open to the whole world. And I think this, this kind of public flaunting of relationships can also become this weird, like almost performance, where you're, it makes friendship almost into like a mercenary, a utilitarian act, where you're, it's kind of about status. It's about, I know such and such person, so I'm going to show the world that I have a relationship with them by posting something on their wall and having a conversation with them. I see this on Twitter a lot, where people, why don't you just have a conversation over email? Like, why do you have to like tag them and then ask them a question just to, just to show people, oh, I have a relationship with this. So I think that's another thing we need to guard against as Christians is turning these relationships, these contacts into this kind of status seeking um, performance of relationship. Now, uh, I think one exception to, to this when it can be a good thing is if someone asks a question on a social media platform and your answer to it is something that others could benefit from seeing, um, then I think you should feel free to engage in public conversation. Um, for example, I, I talked to a friend whose pastor had this example of, on, on the church's Facebook page, some member of the congregation like, shared a, a really hard struggle and had like, a question for the pastor. And the pastor responded in public to this, to this rather intimate uh, problem that this guy had. And in that case, I think it can be a very helpful thing for the community to witness the, the pastoral way that the pastor is ministering to this person. And there may be another person who looks in on this conversation who can also benefit from the interaction. Was there any concern from the person who shared it first um, about that was my private story? 
Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I don't know, but I mean, they, they've shared it, so it's done. So at that point, the pastor could have either chosen to like send, respond privately and say like, hey, we should have this conversation over coffee. But um, since the, the kid initiated it publicly, I think he felt like oh. I can respond publicly. And um, yeah, he had, the, the kid was the one who posted on the wall. Okay, number 10, don't have awkward fights or edgy back and forths in public. So here, here's an example recently that I saw of two Christian leaders who had kind of this test, testy uh, fight on social media. So Al Mohler, he posted this tweet, new article, is the megachurch the new liberalism? Linking to a blog post. Then Rick Warren, who is a megachurch pastor, responds, Al, would a sensational blog title, are the seminaries the new liberals? Be fair if a seminary president messed up. And then Al kind of responds with this snarky, glad to hear from you, Rick. I would certainly not be offended by that title. In fact, I might use it. Mega thanks. So just that like mega thanks, like do we really need that kind of level of, of snark? Like Rick is clearly offended. So I just think these sorts of interactions, doesn't, it doesn't give off a good vibe to the, to the secular world in terms of like, are Christians really engaging in this petty kind of way? <laughs> they are. They are, but should we really be like adding to that no. observe that perception? Yes. Okay. Um, here's another one. Don't revert to junior high name calling voice or pick fights. Pick fights. Here's an example recently. Rachel Held Evans. Mark Driscoll is a bully, but we can stand up to him. So I just think that like bully really you're going to call out someone and name call and social media. Um, I, I just I don't know that there's necessarily an appropriate place for that in the public social media space. Okay, and finally, my final don't is don't tweet something with big implications without running it by a few people. Um, I think the classic example of this is the tweet heard around the world, uh, John Piper's farewell Rob Bell tweet, um, which happened during the whole Love Wins controversy a year or two ago. And, um, you know, John Piper sends this, this tweet that it kind of insinuates like, oh, Rob Bell, you're not a member of the Christian family anymore, goodbye. And that's a pretty serious thing to, to say to a very well-respected Christian pastor and author. And he got a lot, John Piper got a lot of flack for this tweet. And I think um, a little more like consideration and maybe taking a few minutes to run it by someone else might have done him um, some good. And I, I, I John Piper. Oh, yeah. I don't know if he's that old, but he is very set in his ways. Um, yeah. He, he is retiring soon. Is Matt permanent here? We probably shouldn't talk about John Piper around him. Um, so. What was the don't on the last one? I missed it. On the last one. Don't tweet something with big implications without running it by a few people. Uh, at, at Biola, um, I'm the one who tweets on behalf of Biola, and I have a policy, like anytime there's any sort of potentially, um, you know, concerning or controversial tweet, I run it by at least one other person just to get their opinion. Um, and I think that's important. If, if you're like representing an organization or a brand or um, a school or a church, um, you need to be, you need, yeah, or, or just, or just as Christians, who are we representing as Christians? Uh, it's, it's good to have that layer of accountability and not just kind of be emotional and shoot your tweet out in the moment. Okay, <clears throat> so now moving on to the do's, things that I think we can do in a positive way to be better social media users as Christians. First one, uh, do promote the good, interesting, useful work of others. Direct people to helpful resources that aren't produced by you. So essentially this is like, be selfless on social media. It's, an, it's about promoting the best that's out there and directing your community of followers to things that they should see, that they would benefit from. Um, one of my personal um, things that I try to abide by is for every one tweet or status update that I do about myself or about my work, I try to do at least two um, that are about others' work or that I can direct people to other things. I think this is just a good habit to get into. Discipline yourself to use your platform in a way that supports others and isn't just about yourself. Retweet other people's posts, like other people's stuff on Facebook. 
Uh, I think that's, that's a very Christian thing that we can strive to do. Uh, similarly, I would say you should share things that you know your audience will find valuable. Think of their uh, interests before your own. Um, and I think, you know, just thinking back to what permission marketing is, like people are following you for a reason. So you need to think about like, okay, they are following me. What can I give them that they're, they want from me? So if you're a food critic on Twitter, obviously people are following you because they want your expertise in that area. You have credibility in fine cuisine, so that's what you should tweet about. You should tweet about the best restaurant that you found or a new recipe because that's what your audience wants. So always keep the audience in mind. Um, and if you're a pastor, in, in the same way, people are following you um, for a certain type of content. So tweet Bible verses, but the Bible is perfect for Twitter. The average length of every verse in the King James Bible is 100 characters, so it's perfect for a tweet. So. Um, a lot of pastors do that. Rick Warren is really good about that. Um, Randy Alcorn is a Christian author. He's really good about tweeting Bible verses. That's a way you can bless others and give them kind of content that um, they can benefit from. Number three, respond to people's questions when they ask them and ask your audience questions. Interact. So uh, this is what social media is made for. It's all about interaction. It's, it creates this new opportunity to have kind of um, informal conversations and back and forths. So utilize this function. Make it a two-way conversation rather than a one-way. So I manage the, the Facebook pages at Biola and at Talbot, and here's something that we do like on the Talbot School of Theology Facebook page. We'll throw out like interesting interactive questions like how would you summarize the book of First John in two words? And there was 26 people commented and you know people love these sorts of things and it gives them a way to engage in an on-brand way. So this is a seminary, it's a Bible question, it fits. So we do this on the Biola undergrad Facebook page as well. What gospel do you prefer to read? Everyone has an opinion about that. So there were like 40 comments, I think, on this post, 14 likes. Okay, number four, say thanks to people who say something nice to you or about you on social media. This is just kind of common courtesy. And it's something that I think Christians especially should be good about doing. We can't forget to remember the little people that are buying our books and are helping, um, are listening to our sermons or whatever. Like, if people ask you a question or say something nice about you, you need to respond. You need to acknowledge it. Um, don't just be too big for your britches on social media. Number five, be positive, affirming, uplifting, and earnest rather than negative, cynical, critical, or ironic. Uh, as we all know, like the social media space can be just, just overbearingly negative at some times. Like, it's depressing to go on my Facebook page some days because everyone just has something they're complaining about or expressing their frustrations about. And I think as Christians, like if we think about like what our calling is in the world, we are people who have hope. We have the resurrection hope. We shouldn't be perpetuating this culture of cynicism and negativity. We, of all people, should be saying positive, affirming, uplifting things. And uh, I think Twitter can be a very like snarky, ironic space where the discourse is just, it's all just kind of like very snarky. And I, I don't know, for me, that gets old really fast. And I would prefer to you know, be encouraged and have like authentic, um, honest, and earnest, just nice things show up on my Twitter feed. So just bring light to your social media communications. Number six, when you do post about yourself, don't be overly mechanic or self-aware. Be natural, real, and authentic. So, as I said earlier, social media can be this very like constructed space where you can you can like pour over every word of your tweet or your status update to, to think about like how are people going to react to this? Like how can I paint myself in the best light? And sometimes that ends up making you sound very phony and like artificial and constructed. Um, don't write your social media posts like you would write a press release headline. Be real. Inject personality and voice into it. I, I recommend people, just in general in writing, you should write the way that you speak. Don't think of writing as this like overly mechanical thing where you have to like do it in a different way than you speak. So be, feel free to be natural, funny, sincere. Um, don't feel like you have to craft every single tweet like you would craft an essay. Don't over labor it. Don't overthink it. You should think about it a little bit. You should, be, you should have some consideration about the 
how people will perceive what you're about to say, but you shouldn't overthink it. Number seven, if you lead a church or a ministry, be especially careful how you communicate on social media. You're representing your church ministry whether you want to or not. And then for any Christian, as you said, we are representing Christ. So this is, I think this is, you know, so important. Um, what does this mean? I think it means don't say anything, don't put photos up, don't endorse anything that you wouldn't want your ministry to be associated with, that you wouldn't want um, Christ to um, be happy about. Uh, don't, don't obsess about your image on social media, but, don't, but do consider how people are perceiving you. They are watching. Um, for many people, uh, all that they see of you is on social media. That's, that's kind of one of the curious things about our day and age. A lot of people we've never met in person, but they kind of know us just by observing us on social media. And how many of us, like, if we're honest with ourselves, like, go Facebook stalking or like we glean information about someone just by looking at their Facebook photos or observing what they have shared publicly on social media. So we have to remember that for some people, that's all they know of us is our social media presence. So what is it that we're conveying in that space? I think about this like with my non-Christian friends who are following me on Facebook, following me on Twitter. What, what are they observing about me and my faith? Is it apparent that I'm a Christian? Am I behaving like anyone else? Um, I think these are important questions for us to think about. Uh, number eight, let others talk up your books, articles, or products on social media. On occasion, feel free to retweet the praise-giving tweets of others, but only rarely. So if you have something to promote, you know, it's not a bad thing to like ask your friends, like send an email to your closest friends and say like, hey, could you promote on Twitter? Could you send a tweet out? Maybe even give them like a sample text of like, Here's, here are some things you could say about my book or about my article. I think that's fine. Um, and if they do tweet about you, like I think it's okay to like retweet them, but don't get out of hand with that. I know some people, there's one author um, who's a pretty big uh, best-selling Christian author who on Twitter, he literally like retweets every single good thing people say about his books. Some of you might know who I'm talking about because it's just that bad. And um, that's just like unseemly. Like it, people observing that like have to wonder like where's is this really a Christian? Like he doesn't he seems kind of full of himself and egotistical, just retweeting all of these praise giving tweets. Okay, number nine, use social media to bless others, share Bible verses, wise quotes, things that can brighten another's day and or spread the gospel. So the interesting thing about this is um, these sorts of messages on social media actually um, have proven to be more effective. They, they tend to be forwarded more. Uh, they tend to get more traction and responses than the typical, like, what I'm doing right now or what I'm eating for dinner type tweets. So the New York Times actually um, had this article over the weekend in which they talk about like, how, how Christians on Twitter are actually more effective than non-Christians. So, for example, like these two tweets, they compared <clears throat> Joyce Meyer, a Christian, I believe she's a Christian author, um, compared to a Lady Gaga tweet. So both of these tweets received 10,000 reactions, but Joyce Meyer's audience of 900,000 followers engaged with her tweet 27 more times than Lady Gaga's audience of 25 million. So, you know, Joyce has this nice kind of inspirational quote, and um, 521 people out of 50,000 responded, whereas Lady Gaga's little tweet about, I don't know what's, what that's about, flying to Korea, it only had 19 people respond for every 50,000. Here's another example. Max Locato, he has this great Good Friday uh, tweet, and uh, compared to Rihanna's, I, I rised up this morning with the rising sun, uh, that one only got 14 responses for 50,000, whereas like Max Locato, 725. So, you know, these, these tweets that are more encouraging, it actually gives people something inspirational, um, perform better. Here's, here's another example. Andy Stanley, he's a well-known pastor. He sends out a C.S. Lewis quote. It performs way better than this Kim Kardashian quote about being so sleepy in New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Kim Kardashian has like 87 more, times more followers than Andy Stanley, but if you're not tweeting in a, in a helpful way to people, that your tweets aren't gonna perform very well. And then here's one more, back to Rick Warren. See here, Rick is doing a good thing with this tweet. 
Getting older is automatic, growing up is a choice. So he's great about these little, you know, quippy, nice little pearls of wisdom. And people love to retweet that. 259 out of 50,000 responded. Katy Perry, on the other hand, only six out of 50,000 responded to her self-promoting tweet. So I think that should encourage us as Christians, like not only is it's something that we should just be doing because it's the right thing to do to give people these encouraging tweets, but it actually like, you know, probably boost your cloud score. If you think about it that way, that probably shouldn't motivate us, but. <laughs> okay, number 10, use social media to enhance communities, but not replace them. So a lot of people make the case that social media is a great, it's a boon for community. And I think there is some merit to this. Um, in, a, in an article in the Christian Century called The Church on Facebook, author Lenora Rand says that social media sites like Facebook are useful in ministry beyond just information transmission because, quote, they may actually present a new way of being the church. She points out that in some ways, Facebook has filled a social void that the church used to fill. <clears throat> At any given moment in a status update feed, Facebook provides users with, quote, tidbits of honesty, introspection, and vulnerability, confessions of hurt, need and sin. She notes that the, the Facebook social media has become the new social commons, the site where people go to be known and to know. And churches, she thinks churches should embrace this platform or, or else be abandoned and just become irrelevant. Um, Dwight Friesen in his book, Thy Kingdom Connected, he agrees that social media technologies are, are um, adding, they're kind of, they make sense within the context of Christianity. Um, because the church fundamentally is about networks, it's about interconnectedness. He says the kingdom of God has always been a networked reality. Within this nodal, interconnected, networked paradigm, the maxim links our relationships reigns supreme, reinforcing the centrality of connectivity for Christ's church on earth. The church exists in relationship, by relationship, and for relationship. We exist to connect people with God, one another, and with creation in continuity with the capacious nature of scripture. So I think the case can be made that like social media can really enhance communities. For churches, it makes great sense to have a presence on social media. I just think that it's important, as we talked about earlier with the whole intimacy, you know, you still need to make time to like have coffee with someone one-on-one -on -one and have that physical intimacy. Um, that's something that we shouldn't neglect. But we can also view social media as having some positive effects on, on connections and relationships. Okay, number 11, use social media to quickly communicate important and timely information, service times, venue changes. This kind of is just a simple, goes without saying sort of thing, but um, social media is just great for like quick on the go communication to large numbers of people. So it can be perfect for churches and ministries in that regard. And then finally, uh, use social media to respond to local or world events with a comforting, wise voice of authority. So especially if you are like a well-respected author or leader uh, in your church, pastor, I think people want to hear you chime in on what's going on in the world. If, if some big figure has died, you know, send a nice, thoughtful commentary tweet about that. If there's a big, you know, unsettling, troublesome event going on in the world, I think you can use social media to just share a brief, uh, helpful thought for your congregation or for those who follow you. So. Those are just um, some, some tips, some thoughts that I came up with. I would say um, the overall like, takeaways or broad themes that I think I want to communicate is, number one, as in other aspects of our lives where pride and self-focus often get the best of us, we must fight against narcissism in the social media space. I think this is kind of the big theme of social media is it's all about me, it's about what I'm doing right now, it's about promoting myself, and as Christians, like pride is that like core sin that we have to fight against. We're called to deny ourselves, to serve others, and it shouldn't be all about me. So I think with social media, that's one of the biggest things we have to wrestle with. Secondly, as Christians, we should be selfless and care more about others than we do ourselves, and our social media presence should manifest this. We should use social media to spread the gospel and be a light in the darkness. Um, as I said earlier, like social media can be a very dark, negative, place, very cynical place. And I think this can be a great opportunity to be different, to like show, bring some light, bring some like, like those, those inspirational quotes that those pastors um, that they sent out that got forwarded and responded to so, so much. 
um, that can be a way for us to really um, make a difference and be different in social media. And then finally, we should ask ourselves, in all seriousness, what would Jesus tweet? I think, as silly as that is, I think it's important to remember, like, what, what would Jesus have done with social media? Like, uh, would, would he send out, like, verses, or would he send out wise sayings, or would he be talking about what he's eating for breakfast? I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe he would. You know? He liked food. He liked eating. Um, okay, so just some questions. I, I want to have like a time of discussion here um, just to get your feedback. Um, and the questions are, what are some other social media do's and don'ts from your experience that you think Christians or those working in ministry should be mindful of? And then finally, um, what does it look like to be Christ-like in the social media space? What, how, what does that look like? Uh, I think that's a question we should, we should think about. So. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about either of those questions? I would say, to reinforce the point you made before, one thing that we deal with a lot um, with our clients is <clears throat> over-eagerness to put out information on social media, especially before they communicated it to their internal circles. So you talked about their communities. We've seen clients that have tweeted some major news mm -hmm. or whether it's a name change, logo change, slogan change, president stepping down, hiring a new person, when they haven't informed all their internal audiences yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. Being fired. <laughs> uh, in that case, but whether it's mm -hmm. donors or church attendees or students, faculty at the university, those are people that are invested first, and even if it means the possibility that, hey, maybe media or someone could find out before you even send out the official press release or what have you, um, it's important that those folks that are in the know and yeah. invested, that you let them know first. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, a huge don't that you jump the gun on that. Oh, yeah. Um, and it saves a lot of heartache. Right. Because um, there's always going to be that person who's mm. incredibly offended that they don't know. Right. They found out. It's not just the friendship that you right. know, your friend's pregnant a month, but <clears> it applies to friends too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So then that brings up a question, because should there be, if you're sending an email, should there be a waiting period before mm. you release something on Twitter? So if you do a press right. release to like your staff or you're giving a memo, you don't do a tweet at the right. time that you do the memo. For, we've run into this recently with um, high profile faculty at Biola who have announced they're leaving. And the, the announcements of the, their departure, we've thought about like, okay, do we send an email to the internal constituents of Biola, and then a few hours later send an email to external and then send a tweet? Our, ultimately, like, that, that, that doesn't work anymore. In the age of social media, the first people who find out about it, someone in that group will tweet it to the rest of the world. So you can't control, you can't control us. You, our policy is increasingly do it all at the same time. Send out all the emails, all the tweets at the same time because what happened in this case was like the students of this particular department like um, <clears throat> got the email and then one of like some of them tweeted about it before like even the, some of the faculty knew or, and there was all sorts of hurt feelings about that. So yeah. We, yeah. we always do things at the same time. We'll send mm -hmm. the email distribution to the internal and then tweet in media immediately after so that it's, we've communicated to that audience. Whether or not they saw it immediately, they know yeah. that they in good faith. Yeah, so right. First. right. Is there a full-on protocol? You know, or you just kind of have to make it up as you go. There's no... There's an organization, mm -hmm. organization to make it possible. Right. Um, for example, your space that you work in, the financials, um, because of the control of information, nothing goes to social media first before it goes to <coughs> Yeah. Your second question. Mm -hmm. What does it look like to be Christ like to <clears throat> media? Mm -hmm. um, in the theological brain? Um, but Jesus, uh, his, his, his want to control the, community, the conversation about him mm -hmm. um, didn't equal up to the ability to control the conversation. Right. And at some point, 
he kind of let the conversation go. He would say, right. you know, I'm going to do, he did this miracle, don't tell anybody about me. Right. Um, so he had some handle that there were conversations being mm. held about him mm -hmm. that he had no control over. Mm -hmm. Um, but he managed it by walking the truth, walking right. honestly. Right. So that may be the space that we're looking at. Yeah, I think that's a great. Yeah, people who think you can control the conversation on social media are just living in an old media model. Like the the new media world is, you can't with brands. You, a lot of them are afraid of getting on Facebook or Twitter because suddenly they're opening themselves up to very public criticism of their products and their brands. Um, but. Um, there's also an upside to that. You can now like respond and have a public like PR customer service response that people can look in on and see. Oh, they re they're really great about responding to people's problems. Um, so yeah, and I think what you're saying about like being like above reproach. If if we live our lives in a way that like even though we know we can't control what people are saying about us, we, if we live in such a way that is above reproach, um, then we don't have anything to worry about. You know. Other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I have some thoughts because, okay, about being by the voices. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous, it's lovely, like, and it's not a bad thing. But I follow only fake followers on one of my accounts. Mm -hmm. And when I only <coughs> see Bible verses, it's mm -hmm. really great. But it's, it's, you know, I can pick up a Bible right. and read a whole bunch of verses. And right. it doesn't really lend me anything about you. Any yeah. content, like I can try to assume you're struggling right now or you're doing something, but I'd love to know more about you or where you are, or where your company's mm -hmm. basis is, and what you're doing that first. Like, right. You know, and so right. I mean, I understand lending the Christ like or the Christian method to it, but yeah. it's also, you've got to be careful about just being the happy go lucky Christian. Right. I don't, you know, like. Right. Yeah, no, I, th I agree. I think you should balance it between like moments of vulnerability and honesty, like where you do share your humanity. That's why people follow you. Um, that's why people follow Lady Gaga. They want to see her in that inaccessible thing where she's not as polished as she is on t TV. So it's this it's this access that social media gives you to people. So I think it's important to have um, to include that type of content and not just the impersonal. Um, quotes or whatever. Yeah. Um, in our, in, I think a real way the social media space is not different from real space. And so being Christ like in social media space is going to look just like it does in real life. So <laughs> just like you wouldn't walk with <clears throat> someone and expect that to just hear Bible verses only from them. Uh, we don't do that right. in the social media space. And just like your your do's and don'ts, don't be narcissistic. Right. Don't don't humble brag. These are things that are just normal parts of right. real life living right. in Christ's image. And mm -hmm. so just take take the take the kind of common sense uh, way of living in the real world apply that to social media space and I think you'll do probably pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John, did you? I was, I was uh, thinking about not, not everyone has thought through all this stuff probably as well as you have or everyone else in the world. So it makes, there's this one times where I look at something and I go, how can they possibly do that? And it's kind of made me think that I, I probably should add to my list of rules. I need to show grace to other people who don't follow the same set of rules. Mm -hmm. so I think I'm going to use Twitter and Facebook right. in the way that I think Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of to follow up on that, like how do you interact with people who like, maybe you have loose ties with them, but it is like they are not acting in Christ like way, so how can you dialogue or should you dialogue at all with them to kind mm -hmm. of enlighten people or open up the conversation to this idea? Um, right. Because I had a dialogue with someone on Facebook and it was <coughs> this year and it just seemed as if almost um, Proverbs 26.4 came up, like, don't, do not answer a fool according to his father, mm -hmm. or you'll be like him. <coughs> That's what right. I felt after the exchange on Facebook that went to right. 1.30 in the morning. It was just this, right. it got worse and worse, and other people were kind of wondering, why is this guy doing this? Right. Like, so how do you interact when you see someone who's right. a leader, who's influential, and you can't have that private dialogue to say, right. don't do that, and you just ignore it? Yeah, I mean, 
unfollow them. Unlike, like, yeah, I, I think um, what you're getting at is this, th the ease with which we can, we can have arguments in social media that it's so much easier to have it in that space where we're not facing them face to face. Like, I don't, a lot of these people that like get so riled up and angry on social media, I don't see them like getting into like yelling matches in physical life. So this is one of the real threats of social media is that it's so much easier to just like post something controversial just to ruffle feathers and get responses. And then it's, it's irresponsible. Like you wouldn't go into, a, if you're an atheist, you wouldn't walk into a church and shout some annoying thing in the physical church and then just you know be okay with that but an atheist is, is fine going on to like a blog comments or a facebook page and saying something offensive and just there's less accountability it's less of a barrier of you know there's, there's just less at stake on social media and i think we have to consider that um, aspect and anytime we engage in in controversial difficult discussions it might be better to send a private email and then they will have less incentive to defend themselves because of the public comment. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, I think I think my advice is if, if, you, if you have a bone to pick with something, some one person specifically, like why do it on Facebook? Exactly. Like send a private email. Like yes. if, you have, if you have a general bone to pick and it's not just with one person, then maybe you can put it on Facebook and see who responds, who takes the bait. But uh, even then, I just think it's kind of like a, it's a gimmicky tactic, and it's just a way to like elicit response. And, yeah. Let's say, um, depending on your normal conversation on Twitter, um, I know many, many of us are believers. We have our we have our bubble conversation, if you will, our conversation with folks that we think like, we act like, we talk normally with, and then we have a tertiary conversation with people who might not act like us, but <laughs> we either allow ourselves to follow them or allow them to follow us. Um, my recommendation is to increase the tertiary conversations hmm. so that you, you learn to recognize the foolishness before you have to learn to forgive yourself for being foolish. Hmm. So it's before you get into the conversation that drives too far down that you didn't send the email or the DM right after you recognize whether this conversation, this, this looks like this could go awry if I take this the wrong way. Right. Um, because what, what ends up happening is that, um, much like one of the points were said earlier, our light is such that, not so much that everything has to be good or everything has to be perfect, but that we're taking a Christ-like approach to our conversations in a public space. And so if somebody can, you know, <laughs> we're open up to the fact that, you know, Antoine, I really hate the fact that you're thinking that mobile has anything to do with <laughs> ministry. It's all about making money, which is a comment that came out. And I said, well, fine, please, do feel that way. But while you make some money, mind if I grab somebody for Christ? And he really took offense. He took offense at that approach. We talked it out over email and both issued public apology. <coughs> you know, um, so so uh, allow yourself to see those aggressive moments beforehand, but you have to engage or at least be closer than you know, just seeing them through the window right. um, with those personalities, those characteristics that you might not normally uh, fellowship with. That's the other uh, probably benefit to social media is that you can see the rest of the world um, through their own lens. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it gives us the ability um, to say, okay, I can get out into an uncomfy space without necessarily putting my whole life on it all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm wondering if, if anyone, um, this is more coming from a local church context, but. Um, that the people who are on social media with you um, often tend to think that you are, you're checking in so often that you know, there's that, well, I posted on Facebook, how, how did you not get back to me that my mom was not? Right. I DM'd you on Facebook, <clears throat> why didn't you pray for me and my kid was sick? Right. And then that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So that kind of sounds the point of almost having to train the, consume, the consumer of that media um, and, be, and being aware hmm. of that. I just wonder if anyone's ever yeah, there, there is kind of an, like an etiquette to like social media use where you don't want to take advantage of the access that it gives you to people. You don't, you know, you don't want to be that annoying person who's always sending direct messages and trying to get the ear of some big shot. Um, there, you just have to be realistic. Like they don't have time to respond to everything. Um, but yeah, I think when you, one of the like risks for pastors or for CEOs or leaders when you get on social media is you are opening yourself up to 
so much more direct like uh, communication and it takes time like if you if you really want to do social media well and respond to every question or every comment like it, it takes a lot of time that's why you have full-time you know assistants doing social media for these figures and it's why every every company now has a whole staff of social media because it takes one person to monitor the twitter and one person to monitor the facebook page and to respond to every everything that's being said so you might also direct them in your like sorry in, in mm -hmm. just like your bio like post, if you're doing a prayer or something contact my email mm -hmm. if you have a prayer request or something like that that might also be helpful for those of you who are in, who are in ministry or at churches like what are some things that you've done on social media or any success stories of how you've used it? Um, I use it to reach out to the middle school and high school kids. Mm -hmm. um, I work with young life. Mm -hmm. Wildlife is the middle school. And um, <coughs> it's, it's great because they love authenticity. Yeah. And I'm a 12 year old at heart, so it works out really well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I'm posting something on my kid or whatever, um, they're able to engage with someone who's not their mom and dad, but has a mom and right. dad mentality. And we're able to interact in a way that I know they're not interacting with their parents. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of their parents don't even have Facebook mm -hmm. accounts. Don't know that their kids have Facebook accounts. So right. for me, it is a, it is a access to a group of young people who are really rudderless um, I live in a pretty, pretty affluent part of the city, mm -hmm. and there's just these parents. Or, anyways, it's just yeah. wonderful because it allows us to connect in a way that's meaningful to them, because mm -hmm. it's their language. And then we still see them on a regular basis as well. Right. Um, and it, it, it allows us to have one more way to earn the right to talk about Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do think that it's important to set boundaries, though. Like, I've talked to some youth pastors who have cautioned, like, you know, you've got to be careful with how you, like, if you're communicating, if you're like a male youth pastor and having like private Facebook conversations with female students, like obviously there's boundaries with that. But it's also dangerous because as I think you pointed, someone back there pointed out, like there's this expectation now that like if you send a message on f social media, like it has to be responded to. And if you send a text, you know, there's this expectation that if you don't respond within five minutes, like you're mad at me or something. Like the silence of like non-instantaneous response you know, can hurt feelings. And I think a lot of like junior high, you know, age people who are very vulnerable emotionally could, you know, if they don't get an instant response from their youth pastor, if they post something on their Facebook wall, that can, you know, be a problem area. So I just think it's, you have to proceed with caution if you're gonna, if you're gonna navigate that terrain. Yeah. I think in pastoral care and healthcare settings, it's really been wonderful to you know, express concern, mm -hmm. and encouragement, mm -hmm. and to cross the boundaries you know, of the clinical setting because you can text right into the surgical area and mm -hmm. you know, I've been on the getting and receiving end. Mm -hmm. you know, and there are times when I don't want people there. Yeah. You know, but the text and the encouragement <clears throat> is wonderful. You know, right. And it's that human connection that's and so it's really opened up just mm -hmm. an amazing way to encourage and care for people right. in a very accessible way. Yeah. And I've seen like a lot of people like use Facebook and Twitter to like ask for prayer requests, like you know so and so's like in the hospital again, like can you pray for me? And people like it's an instant way to like feel affirmed and cared for, and knowing that such and such people like liked, you know, as you said this morning, like care would be a better word, but it's I think it can be a really good thing to yeah. to share. Working on the caring brave site is the largest community based website. Mm-hmm. The mm -hmm. the yeah. I had some friends who lost their daughter in a tragic church bus accident. And they had like 300,000 mm -hmm. posts. Mm -hmm. you know, and they started a whole nonprofit mm -hmm. uh, in, in honor of their daughter to do acts of kindness and charity. Right. Out of that whole experience of the 300,000 posts. Right. You know, so yeah. God did a lot really good. Yeah, I think, I think social media can be a very therapeutic space for people who are suffering. Um, it can also be a very um, hard place for people who are suffering. People who are single, for example, and like really want to be married, like it's hard to see like engaged, 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 like wedding pictures, wedding pictures. Um, 
but yeah, if you're if you're if you're suffering and you need you need people to like be with you, I think social media can be a quick, easy way. I think one thing that's really interesting to me is like how when people die, like their Facebook walls turn into this like community grieving space. That's I th I would like to like write a dissertation about that or something. Like it's fascinating. Like just like what how social media has changed the way we grieve and like there was um, the Joplin tornado a year ago. Um, there was uh, there was one um, like high school senior that was missing for like weeks. Like he was one of the last victims to his body was found weeks later. So his family created this Facebook page like help us find Ryan or whatever his name was. And um, that page got like 200,000 likes and it was all these people from around the world like we're praying for you, we're, we're, we're there with you, like I hope they find Ryan. And then when they finally did find his body, like it, the page transformed into this like, you know, mass grieving funeral site. And it's just a really interesting thing, like, yeah. Yeah, it was me, my mom passed away four summers ago and that was the age of MySpace. Facebook wasn't there yet. And I did a memorial page, it was my mom's name, mm -hmm. R.I.P. And <clears throat> everyone from the family contributed photographs mm -hmm. and so we ended up with it really helped in planning the funeral too mm -hmm. in a slideshow mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. this each year on her birthday and on the anniversary of her passing i'll send out a facebook post saying go to and i give them the link and add something new or write mom mm -hmm. a note yeah. you know and it, it it's kept our whole uh -huh. family remembering mm -hmm. together and it, yeah that's great really a wonderful you know people in the family who hadn't seen each other in 30 years right were Reconnecting. And right. It was me. Yeah, that's. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. No, please. My twin sister cousins, my brother-in-law, is um, in suffering from cancer, and it's been going through treatment for almost a year now. And um, we've been using social media to guard support, and you know, she's a stay-at-home mom, so we're playing together. Well, you know, but it's it's almost as if their story has kind of become stale. Hmm. And I now am feeling like I kind of need to be a manager of some social media pieces mm. to keep mm. my sister and their mm. story kind of in front of people to mm. continue to get help and money and right. you know, the, just meeting their needs as much as possible. Right. And so I almost, I love social media that it does help bring to light people who have needs, but has anybody else kind of seen how that same mentality that's not fresh, it's not there, mm. is that kind of being applied to people's intimate personal experiences. I mean, it's just mm. it's an odd mm -hmm. feeling I've gotten for the last couple of weeks. Like, right. No one seems to be really caring anymore that Kevin has cancer. Right. You know, and how does that, anybody else kind of experience that? Or anything to overcome? Well, it's kind of the same same way with just in real life. Like, if you don't hear yeah. about someone who, like, like when you first hear that someone's very sick or ailing, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of care. And, stuff. and then as, you, as that stops being in front of you, you kind of forget about it, like, like uh, when when uh, like when when someone someone in your congregation is very sick. A lot of times, uh, you'll, you'll people will start delivering meals, and um, and that will last for a little while, but it kind of gradually <laughs> often tapers off. But in this case, when she she's an active blogger and photographer, so she maintains her own blog. Yeah. You know, we maintain a care. So there's, there's stuff that's out there about, and it's refreshing on a regular basis. It's honestly almost as if, I don't know, people are bored. I, yeah. I, I don't know. It's, I'm, I'm yeah. a little too close to it yeah. to really. Well, and I think, too, that when you start dealing with um, going through a real prolonged crisis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was the strangest thing. My husband and I went through a serious crisis about 20 years ago. It was big news in a small town, and people were all around for a while. But as it drug on, um, it was very strange because people couldn't handle it, and mm -hmm. they just they just faded into the background. It was one of the most interesting things I learned through that. And what I came to conclude was that they couldn't handle it. It was too scary. It was too. They wanted a healing. They wanted an instant response. They wanted God to do <coughs> something. And when they just had to watch the suffering go on. They weren't interested in watching that. It was really hard. And I think it's human nature. I think it's, it's just human nature that we just, if you can't do anything to help, really, you, you turn.
turn your attention somewhere else, mm-hmm. and it's so easy on Facebook mm-hmm. and on those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. It's sad. Yeah, I think I think one of the uh, hard things is like the the threshold on on a Facebook page to like a page is so low. Like it's so easy to like if the, if there's a Facebook page by your cousin like or some acquaintance like help Jimmy battle cancer like our Facebook page like who's not going to like that like it's but then like once you like it you're you're getting all these messages constantly and like if we're honest with ourselves it can become annoying to be bombarded with like all these messages and you don't think about that when you're first asked like hey just like our page but um, you're signing up for like being invested and being part of this struggle and on social media we I think the, the lines can be blurred between what we're actually investing in when we agree to like participate in this community. Like it's a real family struggle. It's not just as easy as liking it, pressing the button. To, to that end, part of it, I think, too, is managing expectations. Um, was recently trying to recalibrate client expectations regarding the Facebook page performance, and um, I think it was either last year or even earlier in 2012, that Facebook announced that only on average something like 16% of any pages fans actually see an average post that the page does. Um, and it really shocked people that people were thinking, you manage a page, you post it, you got, got 5,000 fans, 5,000 people saw it in the news feed. Mm-hmm. Not true. All right. It's really small. And so uh, the same is likely true for personal profiles. Right. Um, I know the algorithm varies based on how much you interact with them view their page and whatnot, but um, part of it is the fact that people are sending out messages thinking that everyone's seeing them when in reality it's not. Right. Um, it's part of what Facebook is doing now is trying to monetize that. So. Yeah. The reach of any given post. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Something that came up, um, a friend of mine and I, we, we connected recently, and we, we came to the conclusion that uh, social media and mobile, um, they sit on a, on a continuum, and we, we call it a time continuum. It's either wasting time or it's, or it's giving time. Um, it says time is the only thing that we, we seem to, to lose and never get back. And what we found with social media, as we discussed, is that social media as a, as a channel is designed to take time. It's not designed to give time back. And because of that, um, we have uh, inflated expectations or unrealistic expectations mm-hmm. that the time that we put into it is going to be the time that somebody else is going to get out of it. Mm-hmm. And it's just as Twitter showed yesterday um, with their engagement metrics, you know, nobody looks at a tweet between 2 a.m. and 9 a.m. in Thailand. In mm-hmm. you know, but in New York City, if you post something at 2 a.m., there's a good chance that 40% of New Yorkers who are awake are going to see it. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> that I'm going to lose sleep and mm-hmm. post on Twitter at 2 a.m. because I know that New Yorkers are going to look at something, or that I'm going to better manage my expectations around mm-hmm. the time that I do post something and don't post another item. Mm-hmm. You know, and if we can kind of, we, we, and if this is a conversation with Aaron that's, that's continuing to develop. He's a psychiatrist um, for a very, 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 very large minister. Uh, uh, if we're trying to wrap our minds around mm-hmm. the fact of does social media as a whole give us what we're putting into it? Hmm. And if it doesn't, what is the right place for right. it? If it's taking away time from our lives, our communities, or, the, or our lives in terms of management, putting content up there, things of that sort, then where do we need to reset our expectations? Right. If, we're, if it's giving time back to us, you know, where, can we, where can we make the most of the fact that it's given, us, given time back to us? Mm-hmm. And that's the hard thing right now about social media. It's too new to make that kind of declaration. Hmm. It's, you know, in terms of Facebook, you can argue it's five years old when it did that. <laughs> you know, but real actual engagement, maybe three and a half. That's not long enough to figure out methods of use, how long it's been used, and who who uses it best, why they use it best, when they mm-hmm. use it best. Mm-hmm. It's not like TV, where you can stick a Nielsen box to it, right. and you know that for every basketball game, two percent of the country is watching, unless it's thunder. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different in our, in our expectations right. towards that. We have to go to what, what are we seeing social media as. If it's a time sink, you know, we should adjust. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a time gainer or a time add, uh, additive to mm-hmm. our life, then we, we, we respect it as such. Mm-hmm. But it, that's a very difficult discussion. Yeah. 
yeah, I think the expectations thing is huge. Like, people expect social media work miracles. Like, brands like who hire social media managers put unfair expectations. Like, it's going to revolutionize our our brand or our business, and it just isn't there yet. We, it hasn't been like you're saying. It hasn't been figured out. It's only five years old, and um, and I think on a personal level, people often invest too much of themselves into it. Like in you know, you can post something, and if you only get like three likes, like it makes people depressed. Like, why didn't why didn't people like what I said? Like, and that's just unfortunate that people are investing so much of their worth, their value is validated by how many people comment on what they had to say, or how many people like what the photo that they put up there. So I think as we're thinking about using social media in a in a Christian, in a good way, and, and guiding our young people and how they use it, we should, I think, emphasize this. Like, just lower your expectations. Like, this is just something that adds a layer to your life, but it does, it isn't your life, and you shouldn't value yourself and like think of your identity in terms of how your social media self is perceived. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.